It's AFA Today on AFR Talk, and if you're listening by way of the, or watching by way of the AFA channel, we welcome you to the broadcast as well. It is, uh, that is the uh, uh, shot of Times Square in the middle of the day on a beautiful spring day here in New York. So glad you're with us. Uh, we've got lots to get to yet. Uh, Americans are expressing their opinion on uh, yet something else that's uh, not going exactly the way they anticipated it would, and we're going to tell you the, the results of that uh, coming up because I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, Kevin McCullough is my name. My phone number is 888-589-8840, uh, But some of you want to weigh in on uh, some of the other stuff before we get to that story. So let me get to uh, Hector in South Carolina. Hector, you're up first. Welcome. You're on with Kevin McCullough. Hi. Uh, yeah, Hector, are you there? Hey, Kevin, uh, just wanted to make a few comments, then I got a question, if that's okay. Be, be efficient with it, because we've got a lot of people that want to get on. Yeah, I'll be quick. Listen, you know what's wrong with our country and what's wrong with the world? You know, I'm going to speak for our country. I'm not going to speak for the whole world. But anyway, what's wrong is the church, not everybody mm-hmm. in the church, because people are doing what they're supposed to do and following Christ like they're supposed to. So I'm going to make that qualification. But for years and years and years now, for decades, the church has sat on their duff and not done what they're supposed to do, swallowing the lie that God's in total control, and he's not. He put, gave us responsibilities from the very beginning to rule and to do and control things in this earth, and they haven't been doing it like they should have been putting responsibility on God. And let, let me, let me tweak, let me, let me, let me tweak years. something, Hector, let me tweak something you said there for a second. God is in total control. That is absolutely true. It doesn't negate, however, his sovereignty doesn't negate our stewardship. Both are equally theologically true and important, and both must be understood properly. That's why we continue to labor, because we are stewards of what he gives us, but God is never not in control. He's always in control, and uh, his, his sovereignty of the situation is one of the aspects that makes him God. If he, if, if he wasn't sovereign, he could not be God. So it, it, I just I want to make that clarification because sometimes things slip by, and I just want to make sure we're getting accurate stuff. Are you there? Yes. And, yeah, um, okay, go ahead. Anyway, he's sitting back watching his children uh, to see if they're going to do as his son did, to do as Christ did. See, if, what's wrong with the body of Christ is they're not working in unity. We're not working in unity. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the shape we're in in our country if the church had been doing all along what they're supposed to have been doing. Things are out of control because there's nothing to, been to keep the evil in check, and God's not going to reach down out of the sky and start adjusting this and that and the other. Yeah, we're supposed to put certain things in God's hands we can't control, but not everything. He, he, he gives us the, that's the what I. That's what I was just saying, Hector. Mental giftedness to, to do what we're supposed to do as a church body. Right. No, that's what I was just saying. And I don't think unity is the problem. I think obedience is the problem. Yeah, See, yeah. You, can, you can be unified around something that's really stupid, and the, the fact that you're all unified around it doesn't, doesn't make any difference at all. And I hear this a lot, uh, actually, from Christians. Well, if the church was just more unified. No, I think we should be more obedient. And when people are not obedient, what happens is you get all kinds of false teaching that starts coming in. Like this, like this guy that wrote the book, God and the Gay Christian, and it's, it's now a bestseller, and all these people are responding to it, and pastors are reading it. And, you know, I think it was part of the, what influenced uh, even like World Vision, because they're sitting there going, oh, my goodness, well, if it's possible that you can think that the Bible is authoritative uh, and still accept uh, b- homosexual behavior, uh, then uh, we don't have a problem here. And I'm like... <laughs> Does anybody actually read the Bible? Because it's not, it, it, th- this isn't vague. Th- this, is, this is not a mystery. This is not one of the deeper things of the faith that must be discerned from hours of meditation and reflection. There may be those things present in the uh, Christian's life. This isn't one of them. God's will on sexuality is not, is not hidden. It's not behind a veil. God's will on sexuality is One man, one woman, married, lifetime, and anything else outside of that, abstinence. That's that's God's design for sexuality. One man, one woman, for life. Everything else outside of that, abstinence. I'm sorry. Uh, You know, if you you apply the thinking that Matthew Vines does in his book to... uh, normal, red-blooded, heterosexual men. They could make the same argument. 
well, God won't be all that mad at me for watching porn. I I was born to enjoy porn, and porn is something that will, uh, you know, uh, satisfy a piece of me that I won't be able to feel like I'm really myself unless I do. I mean, all the same garbage that you can argue about the need for the sexual. See, here's where I draw the line. A lot of people in Christianity have been very judgmental about who people think that they are. So when a, so when someone who says, well, I don't know, I've already struggled with these attractions and these uh, uh, inclinations and so forth, that's not the point where the Christian should jump on them and try to kill them. That's the point where we should say, okay, look, all of us, all of us have been born with attractions and impulses and inclinations and desires that are that are not good for us. We're we're all born that way. There are things about us in every uh, piece of life that we uh, suffer temptation with, and and so the fact that we are born a certain way and we have desires and inclinations that are not good uh, should not surprise us. We we're all we, we all fall under that category. Where Christians need to draw the line and need to say, okay, let's set aside what you think you are, what you what you believe you've been born to struggle with, what you've been believed that uh, you're dealing with in this way, that you're trying to make yourself unique in, which you're not really unique in. Everybody struggles with sexual identity. Everybody struggles with sexual purity. Everybody struggles with sexual integrity. There's not a man on the planet that's never lusted in his heart. Not a one. So, so why did God encourage us to address it and to deal with it? Because it's a sin that invades everybody. So you have, you have the reality of thinking, I'm born a certain way or whatever. No, everybody's born a certain way. The call of God on a person's life is to pull you out of how you are born. It's to pull you to a better life. It's to pull you to something that you can only access through redemption in Jesus. And Jesus didn't get saved, die on the cross, uh, be resurrected, start walking around, give us the Holy Spirit, go back to his Father in heaven just so we could sit on our couch and go, uh, well, uh, uh, I guess I'll watch porn because that's how I'm born. No, he, he brought us to something much better. And it's the same for any sexual sin. Sexual sins are not, uh, they're not unique. Anybody that struggles with pornography, you're really not that much different than somebody who struggles with um, flirting with people at the office that you shouldn't, committing adultery on the side when you're out of town from your family, uh, 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 struggling with same-sex attraction and and, uh, sexual activity in that way. The only difference in all of those is that we still, as a a culture, look down upon the adulterer and the pornographer, and uh, publicly we do. Now, privately, there's a lot of people that accept all this stuff, but publicly there's still a stigma in the society that we look down on those other things. We don't look down on homosexual behavior anymore. We celebrate it in the culture. The culture's like, yay, he came out. Okay, what, what are you celebrating? Why is that a happy thing? He's going to be more likely to commit suicide, more likely to catch a fatal STD. There's tons of reasons why that's not such a good thing. But we, we as a culture, we, we ignore all of that. We say, oh, that's so great. That's so great. Now he's getting the kind of sex that he's always wanted to get. And we're so happy for him. And the, and the damnable thing about this, I mean, truly damnation-like thing about this, the, the, the stuff that is just the pure evil of this is that this is getting into the pulpits. This is getting into the hearts and the minds of the shepherds that are supposed to be fiercely defending the word of God in season and out of season. And no, we're, we're leading the, sh- the sheep right off the cliff. <laughs> Thinking that we're doing some great thing because, you know, grace, well, grace would just let us you know, grace doesn't prejudge, and grace just gives us freedom to be who we're supposed to be. No. Grace is a gift that we did not deserve. Mercy is withholding judgment that we do deserve. Grace is being given something that we don't deserve. And we've got us all mixed up. We think that grace is letting people sin and say, oh, well, just do it. God understands. He loves you. Well, we would never say that to a husband who was cheating on his wife. We would never say that to a young man caught in the ravages of pornography. We would never say that to a ton of different people in a ton of different situations. But in the church, seminary-educated people, Bible college-educated people, 
pastors that are manning pulpits this coming Sunday will stand up and go, I'm not going to really teach on that stuff anymore. We're just going to talk about God's love. To hooey with that. Enough about God's love. We know that God loves us because we're still walking around. If God didn't love us, he could strike us dead tomorrow, and he might. The issue here is, what will the people inside the church, what will those who follow Jesus, what will we say about what he said? And if we lie about the Bible, and if we speak heresy and falsehood from the pulpit, and we say to people, no, 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 you're okay, you're okay, just, you know, God doesn't expect you to get it all together, you know, uh, there's time to work all of that out, and there is. Sanctification, the part where we become more Christ-like as we follow him, is a slower process. But liberation from sin and the consequences of it in this life and in the life to come can happen almost immediately. And people need to know that once they begin the journey of following Jesus, once they've asked him to forgive them of their sins and he becomes their Lord and Savior, they are eternally set free from the consequences of that sin. Old things are put away. Someone has become new. Therefore, it is, it is heresy. It is damnation. It is judgment upon the church for us to stand in the pulpit and go, well, it's not that big of a deal. Come on, just, just, just work with us. I did not intend to make this the entire show today. I've got six other news stories I intended to do with you. But obviously, this is what we're going to talk about. 888-589-8840. Let's go to uh, Kyle in Arkansas. Kyle, thanks for your patience. You're up next with Kevin McCullough. Hi. Okay, Kevin, thanks for taking the call. Uh, what I wanted to comment on, and I, I don't know if you're big into like boycotting or avoiding companies, but the company that, that uh, the Bible publisher for this company is Multnomah, the 1-800-Christian uh, phone number. And evidently it's a subsidiary or some smaller company under them, Convergent Press, I believe that's kind of putting this out. Excuse me. So what I was wanting to get across to the listeners is be careful where you're buy, buying your Bibles and your Christian books from because on their yep. website as of today, there's a big ad for Mother's Day gifts of Bibles and Christian books that that company is going to try and take Christian money to, to continue putting out this other, this, uh, I don't even call them gay, I call them homosexual marriage person. Uh, but that's something I wanted to, to see what your thought on that was. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, and I, I did know that it was Multnomah, and I had intended to even mention that, and I failed to. So thank you for uh, doing that for me. Um, and, Kyle, thanks for your thoughts. 888-589-8840. Okay, the, the phone line's just steaming up, so I'm going to let you uh, sound off here. Let's talk to Jay, also in Arkansas. Hi, Jay. Welcome. You're on with Kevin McCullough. The phone line's just steaming up, so I'm going to let you. Uh... Okay, Jay. Come on, come on, come on. Answer the phone. Hi, Jay, are you there? I go yeah. Why are we arguing about the gays and lesbians? Why can't we make a law to where it states that as soon as they can procreate, we'll give them a marriage license? I mean, that could shut everybody up and stop the, part, stop the argument. Well, Jay, I don't know if you've noticed, um, we, we didn't used to believe this way, but there's been a massive PR campaign underway for 30 years, and they've been pretty I, effective at it. I understand that, but, I mean, it does just, we've been good at passing laws for, you know, crazier crap than... than than this, why don't we just think, you know, put it in a law saying, hey, as soon as you guys can procreate without any medical without medical surgery or anything, we'll give you your license. We can go back on the topics that really matters, like the the uh, ranger has been dropped over there. Uh, I can't think where is that now, but uh, well, if you it. if you don't think that the redesigning of the society around um, a, a false teaching of God's word is relevant to the current day culture, I could see how you would think this isn't a very important topic. Uh, but I actually believe that it is. 888-589-8840. Let's talk to uh, Al in Mississippi. Hi, Al. Welcome. Hey, thank you for accepting my call. I, I really believe that God's sovereignty kind of works both ways, though, because in my understanding of the Bible, he created both good and evil, meaning like the devil didn't create himself. The devil has a creator as well, and all the evils that the devil has done God's sovereignty, he knows what the devil is going to do before he does it. So, like, if he puts up an, a wicked king in a position, it's not like God's sovereignty, God wouldn't allow it. He, he, he allows evil just like he allows good. So right. I, I, I didn't say that he didn't allow evil. 
No, I mean, he started evil. In the Bible, Isaiah said he created evil as well as, so if he created it, he knows all about it. And there's nothing that God doesn't know. So I, I just kind of believe that really and truly when we kind of like put, like paint pictures of like, this is the devil, this is the God, I'm saying it's all of God because the devil didn't create himself. Uh, he he created Lucifer, and Lucifer chose to betray and deny the God that made him. So God created the choice, and Lucifer did, in fact, choose uh, to deny him. And he gives us the same right. We have the right to, to deny God if we want and to deny his word and his will and everything else. I, I'm not sure what your point is. No, I'm, I'm saying God's sovereignty knew that the devil was going to rebel. It, it's not like the devil surprised okay. God. Okay, admitted. Rebelled. God knew that the devil was going to rebel. And your point is? My point is, that means we can't put all of the fault on the devil if God knows what the devil is going to do before the yeah, devil. Yeah, we can. Does. Yes, we can. We absolutely can. One is the father of lies. One is the father of truth. All right, uh, 888-589-8840. And see, I don't have to sit there and think about that and study my navel to come up with some conclusion as to whether what he was just saying. No, it's true. God is the father of truth. He's the origin of truth. Stay with us. It's AFA Today.